In this video, I want to talk to you about something very, very important and very, very interesting about the basic organisation of the nervous system. And this is that the sensory and motor systems actually occupy specific places within the nervous system, and this can help us to understand their anatomy. So let's start off by just considering the relationship between the sensory and motor systems. We know that sensory information comes into the nervous system through um, sensory neurons. Um, it is processed in some way. And this processing leads to a motor output. OK, so this is the very simple um, flow of information within the nervous system that we've talked about before. To use more technical terminology, sensory information comes in along afferent neurons. The processing essentially, although of course it's much more complex than this, but the processing essentially takes place amongst interneurons. And the output um, is sent out to the periphery via efferent neurons. Now, what has this got to do with the anatomy of the nervous system? Well, it turns out that sensory neurons and interneurons and efferent neurons have different, distinct embryological origins. And in order to see where they come from, we've got to go back to the neural tube. So let's draw the neural tube just very, very simply. So here, here is our neural tube. I'm going to draw it just here. Um, of course, it has a thickness and it has a central lumen. And the neural tube at this stage, I'm just going to draw it as being one cell thick. But of course, it becomes many cells thick as it starts to grow and develop. Um, I shall define this as the dorsal side of the neural tube and this as the ventral side and it is very very important that I draw a line separating the dorsal half of the neural tube from the ventral half of the neural tube. The dorsal half of the neural tube we call the alar or roof plate okay so this is the alar but I think it's easier to remember it as the roof plate. And the ventral half of the neural tube is called the basal or the floor plate. And it is from these two regions that the various neurons of the central nervous system are derived. Now, how is this asymmetry created? You know, how is this asymmetry between alar and basal plates created? Well, the important inductive influence on the neural tube, you should remember, is the notochord. All right, so here is the notochord. And the notochord um, releases a variety of chemical factors which induce the cells of the ventral half of the neural tube to become basal plate cells. So the notochord is what breaks the symmetry of the neural tube and starts to form it into alar and basal plates. Now, the key thing about the um, alar and basal, or the roof and the floor plate, is that the floor plate on the ventral side gives rise to motor neurons and the alar or roof plate on the dorsal side gives rise to sensory neurons sensory and interneurons all right so parts of the nervous system that are dorsal i.e. posterior tend to contain sensory neurons, parts of the nervous system that are ventral, i.e. anterior, tend to contain motor neurons. And this is a very, very important distinction for us to make. 
and let's take a look at some specific examples of this. The first specific example and one that you should already know is in the spinal cord all right so let's just remind ourselves of the relationship we said that the roof plate the alar plate is on the dorsal side and we said that dorsal the dorsal side gives rise to sensory neurons and interneurons we said that the basal or floor plate on the ventral side gives rise to motor neurons. So let's draw in the spinal cord and let's just draw the grey matter of the spinal cord. So here is the grey matter of the spinal cord and remember it's butterfly shaped, central canal. There is um, a dorsal horn on the dorsal side and there is a ventral horn on the ventral side. Remember that the dorsal horn is sensory in function, connects to the dorsal root, and the ventral horn is motor in function, connects to the ventral root. So the spinal cord follows this pattern of roof and four plates, sensory and motor. Okay, so spinal cord. Let's work our way up. Now let's consider the midbrain, all right? So we've done the cord. Now let's do the midbrain. Does this pattern hold up at the level of the midbrain? So I'm going to try and draw the midbrain. I'm not a brilliant drawer, but this is going to kind of look like the midbrain. So once again, this is the ventral side, this is the dorsal side. The midbrain has these two cerebral peduncles, which connect to the cerebral hemispheres. And it also then has a dorsal portion which has got two swellings on the dorsal portion, which are the colliculi, and it's got the um, cerebral aqueduct just in there, continuous with the central canal of the cord. <clears throat> so, let's think about two key regions in the midbrain. The um, cerebral peduncles here, the cerebral peduncles contain the corticospinal tracts, the corticospinal tracts are motor. Okay. The colliculi, which are here, okay, they could be the superior colliculus or the inferior colliculus. The colliculi contain regions of grey matter which are involved in receiving visual or auditory stimuli. So they are sensory. All right. So once again, we have got um, a watershed, if you like, a boundary between dorsal and ventral within the midbrain. Um, and these structures are derived either from the roof or the floor plate. If they're from the roof plate, they're sensory. If they're from the floor plate, they're motor. Finally, let's look at the medulla. Now, the medulla in cross-section um, looks a little bit like this, okay? So let me try to draw the medulla for you. Once again, this is ventral, this is dorsal. So the medulla has two prominent ventral bulges, and then it has a series of smaller bulges on the dorsal aspect. I mean, of course, it varies by the level, um, but, but, but this is the medulla. The medulla has a larger cavity in the centre, which is the, the uh, fourth ventricle, uh, but I'm not going to draw that on. So what are some pertinent parts of the medulla? Well, these two ventral bulges here are the pyramids. And the pyramids are once again part of the corticospinal tract, and they are motor. Sitting dorsally in the medulla, we have the dorsal column nuclei. So we have various dorsal column nuclei receiving axons from the um, gracile and cuneate fasciculi. So these are the dorsal column nuclei, and they are sensory. So once again, in the medulla, there is a distinction between dorsal and ventral, on the dorsal side, we have structures which are sensory. 
derived from the um, roof plate on the ventral side, structures which are motor related to the floor plate. So it really does hold throughout the nervous system. What about the cerebral hemispheres? Well, the cerebral hemispheres are much more complex in their development. However, there is a pattern which um, does fit what we've talked about, but not for quite the same reason. If we just sketch out um, a lateral view of the cerebral hemisphere, okay, you should remember that we have um, the central sulcus here. The central sulcus. And remember that we said that, so this is anterior, and this is posterior. Remember we said if you're anterior to the central sulcus, that's frontal lobe. Frontal lobe contains primarily motor structures. So we have motor structures sitting in front of the central sulcus. Posterior to the central sulcus, we've got parietal lobe, occipital lobe, which are sensory structures. So this pattern does hold even up in the cerebral cortex, but not for the same reasons as what we've talked about before. Now, I think that this pattern is really helpful. It helps us to understand uh, a lot about the cross-sectional anatomy of the central nervous system. And I think you should always have it at the back of your mind uh, when you're trying to learn where the different parts um, and different pathways are within the brain and spinal cord. Thank you for listening.